Okay. Good evening. This is Rob Bell. You're watching Getting the Record Straight. Um, this is our uh, Black Rock and Soul edition. Mm. We talk about music and artists and particularly those from Philadelphia. Uh, when you watch this, please uh, subscribe, share, like, and most importantly, stay safe right now. Mm. Uh, with me this evening is um, somebody I've been, I got to apologize publicly because I've been harassing <laughs> this no, guy for like five no, no, no. or six months, but he's the <laughs> baddest dude on base in the world, certainly in Philadelphia. Nobody rocks the bass like Jamal Adin Takuma. He's my guest this evening. He's another one of the Philadelphia treasures I talk about uh, in this city, and I've had the uh, pleasure of interviewing. And so, um, welcome, Jamal Adin. How you doing, man? Okay, Robert. I appreciate it, brother. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> You know, and I just didn't want you to think that I was running out. You know, there's a lot going on. But listen, brother, I'm, I'm just happy that we're able to connect. And mm -hmm. I appreciate you for all this work, that great work that you're doing. And, you know, you're being diligent about it. So I'm I'm cool with that, you know. I'm trying, man. You know, I was thinking, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I first, I think I first got turned on to you through uh, J. Michael Harrison and, uh, yeah. and uh, WRTI. Right. Bridge show that he does. Right. And of course, Jay Michael's been on this show uh, because he's another treasure yeah. here in Philly. And um, but yeah, man, it's just great to have you. Um, I saw you. I think I saw you at the art museum. Okay. Down uh, at least once, if not twice. Mm -hmm. And then most recently, last year, you were out at Vernon Park in Germantown. Yeah, 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 yeah. On a thing, uh, my boy Supreme Dow, who's yep. also been on this show. Okay, good. You know, Supreme good. Uh, ran for state rep. Yeah, yeah. Recently, and uh, by the way, he's had, this guy has, I, I guess it's still up, but he put together a nice little uh, pre uh, display, like museum type thing. We've okay. got the Black Writers thing going on in Vernon right. Park. Vernon and Park, in right. that, because uh, we just went a couple of weeks ago, he had a tribute to, uh, uh, you know, the Black arts folks of the right. late 60s, early 70s, and right. Gil Scott Heron in particular. It was a really nice little piece that he put together. Uh, oh, okay. I don't know if it's still happening, but anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Vernon Park, it was what dude on that my dude was there as well. Yeah. yeah. Part of this uh, this group I put together called Brother Zone. Oh, okay. So, you know, there's a couple of configurations of that, but my dude has always been, you know, part of that. Yeah, yeah he's he's incredible. And uh, hopefully I'm going to have him on soon, too. Yeah. Um, he just recorded an album. That's what I heard. Yeah. yeah I, I, heard, I didn't realize a good, a, 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 a mutual friend, a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. is a friend of his I didn't know. Oh, okay. I didn't know that, and so uh, I'm hoping to connect with him yeah. soon, you know. And that album is called The Loving. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's coming out soon. I produced a couple tracks on it, so it's nice. It's Did you really? Great. I can't wait to hear it, man. He's it's nice. He's fantastic. But uh, yeah, man, so, you, you know, um, as I've said that many times when I've been doing these interviews, like Philly is just filled with genius and treasures yeah, and, a lot of talent and i here. think you're one of them uh i'm just you know regret the fact that um you know it took me so long to get hip to what, to what you were doing <laughs> in fact i think you may have been at temple at the same time uh, i was i was there well i took the very long uh, uh okay. course load that, you know uh, i never went to temple though i never went to i, never oh, went well, to I thought Bayes, uh, brian had told me that that's where he met you but i I guess I uh, Brian Basemore? Yeah. Uh, -huh. uh we was running and probably running around, but I lived, <laughs> I, lived, <laughs> I lived in that area. I live right in the projects. Oh, okay. Left Richard Denar Allen? No, no, the Norris projects. Oh, okay. Like Left to Norris, uh Tiffin Burks, you know, that whole area. Sure, uh, yeah. Uh, Uptown Theater was right around the corner, which I frequented mm -hmm. a lot, as well as the um uh, my my junior high school, John Wanamaker Junior High. So <laughs> I was in that area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, I used to work for the Philadelphia Housing Authority, so I okay. know okay. Norris, Norris Apartments well. Yeah. Um, where'd you go to high school? Thomas A. Edison, 8th and Lehigh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, a, a famous graduate of that just passed away, Herb Batterly. Uh, 
Herb Adderley. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so is that where you kind of started with the music at, at Edison? Or? Uh, actually not. Actually not. I started, you know, what happened, my situation was, we, you know, we used to frequent the Uptown Theater. We would see all of the groups there. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, during that time, um, Brenda Payton of Brenda Payton and the Tabulation, Brenda and the Tabulations, they lived in Norris Projects too. So her <laughs> brothers and all lived there, and we had a group called the Versatones. So I was basically a singer before I started playing the bass. And I would see all the groups at the Uptown. We wanted to be just like them, you know, the Five Stair Steps, you know, mm -hmm. the Manhattans, mm -hmm. you know, stylistic. So Delphonic. So we saw all of that stuff, and all that stuff stuck with me. My mother used to send me down to North Carolina every summer to escape the gang warfare that was happening in Philly. Mm -hmm. My uncle and aunt down there, they had a tobacco farm, and I would go down there every summer and help them on the tobacco farm and, you know, and, 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 and learn about farming and this, that, and the other. And so in that house, my, my aunt had it, it was an old guitar laying, laying against the wall, mm -hmm. and it only had two, uh, two strings, or four strings on it. And so I didn't know the difference between, a, you know, a, a guitar having six strings and it, it was, it didn't have the other two strings, it just had four strings on it, which is the amount of strings that the standard bass guitar has, four strings, mm. as opposed to six strings. So I didn't know anything, I would pick it up and I would just play, you know, something on one string and I learned how to play Get Ready by the Temptations on one string. <laughs> Cause I was like, <laughs> that was like do, 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 on one string. So I learned how to do that, that was cool. <laughs> So when I came back home, you know, I told my, and I did that the whole summer, you know, just <laughs> fiddling around with it. And, and uh, my mother and I, we were walking, when I came back home, uh, we were walking on German, uh, Erie in Germantown and Erie. There was a pawn mm -hmm. shop there that I just rolled by it actually and I found out that they, turned, they tore it down. But this mm -hmm. pawn shop has been there forever. Walk past the pawn shop, I look up, and I see this white bass guitar and I, I told my mom, I said, oh man, I'd love to have that. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have that. So she got together with my sister. One day I came home about a week later. One day I came home from school, ran upstairs. All my bed was this box. Mm -hmm. Opened the box up. It was that white bass guitar that I say I wanted. Mm -hmm. For about a week, I was messing around with it. I met this guitar player named Michael Broadnax, who was a guitar player from a band called The Soul Experience. I told him that I've been playing for years. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him I had all this equipment. Which was, you know, like if you had a lot of equipment back then, you was having it. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, I got together with him about two or three rehearsals, not really know what I was doing, but I was hearing it, I was feeling it, and I was grabbing it. And so the night of the show came that Friday, he says, uh, okay, so we're going to come pick you up, you know, for the gig, you know, with all your stuff. I said, I said oh, man, I, don't, I, ain't got, I ain't got all that stuff. I said, I had, he forgave me, let me play with them. We started out as the Soul Experience. We played alongside the Soul Divines, which was another group here in Philly. Sure, sure. Soul Phonics, Breakwater, uh, Sundown, mm -hmm. uh, and all the groups that were happening, the local bands that were happening at the time. And we, our, our home base was at the Connie Mac Recreation Center, which was right around the corner from Dobbins. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there, our manager was there. He was the, uh, the director of the center. He was our manager. We, we rehearsed there. And on Sundays, we used to have these dances, you know, there, and everybody would play there. You know, it would be Breakwater one week, uh, Little Red and the Fireballs one week, Soul <laughs> Phonics one week, Soul, Us the Soul Experience one week. And we would play, everybody would be playing the same stuff. You know, Chicago, Mandrill, <laughs> Santana, you know, Cool and the Yang, you know, James <laughs> Brown. So, you know, it was always like the Battle of the Band kind of thing that was happening. It was cool. And that's where I grew my chops. Grew up there, um, started you know playing in high school. Mr. George Allen, who's at Grads High School, sort of took me in as well. And um, Mr. Robert Joel at Wanamaker. I wasn't in the music program because I wanted to play basketball. So mm -hmm. I used to you know not go to I, you know not go to basketball practice and hang out with the musicians in the, in the musician room, you know. So that's how I started. Uh, went to Edison. Uh, thought I was going to play basketball there. I said, I definitely made the, 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 uh, the, the um, you know, I, I chose exactly what I wanted to do. I remember that distinctly. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to play, I'm not going, I'm not going to basketball practice. I'm going to band <laughs> practice. So, so I went to band practice and, and, and learn how to play, you know, with the school band there, playing all the jazz standards and stuff like that. Graduated from Edison, uh, 
was going to, uh, at the same time I was going to Edison, I was taking lessons with Tyrone Brown, uh, who had a, he was in a band called Catalyst. And he was also the first, one of the first electric bass players with Grover Washington Jr. They had a band called Locksmith, which was like the, Grover Washington's band. It was Sherman Ferguson, no, it was uh, uh, Grover's brother, Darrell Washington on drums, uh, Tyrone Brown on bass. Um, uh, who else was it? Uh, uh, Sid Simmons on piano. Um, and John Blake on violin. Mm, mm -hmm. So that you know, they did all the stuff. They recorded the live album at the Bijou, I think it was. Mm. So you know, the Model Cities was a program that they toured at as well. Odin Pope, Tyrone Brown, Sherman Ferguson. Wow. They were also the band for Pat Martino. They had this band called Catalyst, but they were also the band for Pat Martino, the guitarist. So you know. They would have classes with us. We would learn with them. Jimmy Merritt was there, also the bass player, uh, teaching bass there. So when I graduated from high school, Sherman suggested that I play with this organ player from Philadelphia named Charles Erlen, <laughs> who his nickname was no, the Mighty no. Burner. Mighty Burner. <laughs> Mighty Burner. So I played with him for a year until he fired me. <laughs> uh, and it was strange. That was a really strange event because we had a gig in, in a, a club in Newark, New Jersey called the Key Club. You know, it was a little hole in the wall kind of club, but everybody played there because it was part of that circuit. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was with Charles for about a year. So this one particular gig, you know, um, after the gig, he says, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to use you anymore. You know, I got my pay. And he's, and I was like, okay, I was like, okay, well, I understand that. But I, 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 need, I just need to know why. Because if I don't, if I don't find out why, it's going to haunt me for the rest of my, mm -hmm. my life and my career or whatever. So he says, you know, the reason I'm not going to use you is because you're timing. I say, what my timing? You gotta be kidding me. The drummer and I, we killing it every night. Abe Smeller, he was a drummer. I said, we killing it every night. I think what it was was that here's this young cat from Philly. The bass guitar was a kind of a new instrument to him because he also he always played the bass on the organ. Mm. You know, the, you know, he would have the bass happening with one hand and then the chords with another. So he was used to that. Now, I don't think that he really got used to the bass guitar being, because, you know, I would be playing sometimes, you know, when, when my solo came, I would solo and, you know, I'd get it to it. And he was like, mm, you, know, <laughs> I, you know, I'd come with a gold guitar strap, you know, and, and at that time we had these shoes called Earth Shoes that was happening in the 70s. The Earth Shoes, <laughs> like, you know, hippie shoes. Most of the shoes were brown. I had some white ones. So, you know, he was like, mm. he was like, oh, young boy, you know, <laughs> you know, so. That was cool. But actually, one week later, I remember coming home with my upright bass, my electric bass, my suitcase. And uh, I was home. I went back you know, right on 10th Street, 10th and, Nars, 10th and Burks. And, uh, you know, I said, Mom, I'm coming home. You know, I've been on the year. I was about 19 years old. I said, I'm coming home. Been on the road for a year. She said, all right, all right, baby, come on home. So I got home. About one week later, I got a telephone call from Reggie Lucas and James and Tume. Mm. Reggie Lucas was the guitarist for Miles. Miles Davis at the time, and James and Tume was the, the percussionist with Miles at the time. Mm -hmm. And they, well, actually, Je, uh, James and Tume had, the, he had a group called Tume later. Right. He's, he's from Philly, right? Philly, yeah. He's, the, he, he's one of the, he's a brother's son, Jimmy Heath's son. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were, they were with Miles, and then they became producers as well later on. Uh, Reggie producing the first Madonna album, which was like uh, smashed all his <laughs> smash. You know, he produced, you know, like a vir no, not like a virgin, but the other ones, um, Holiday and um, why am Lord I Lime. thinking? Why am I always thinking that it was um, the boys from Chic? That was now now did like a virgin. He did all the later stuff. Oh, but okay. The first album, Reggie Lucas produced it. Okay. Other from Philly, you know. Yeah, man. And, and then, and then, and then they also uh, produced. Well, you know, and Tumi had his record, Juicy Fruit, which right. you know Biggie sampled. So that was huge <laughs> for him. But at the same time, they were also producing Stephanie Mills. You know, they yeah. had all early Stephanie Mills stuff. Mm. Uh, they that was had great their, stuff too. Yeah, that was great stuff. They had a mm -hmm. body in it. You know, um, yeah. uh, they had um, what was what's the name? The uh, Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack. Um, Back Together Again, that was sure. Reggie in, in James's tracks. Um, you know, so they were, you know, they were producers. So they called, they, they, they called me up at that time and said, you know, we're with Miles right now. Uh, this saxophone player named Ornette Coleman 
wants to know uh, if you would be interested in coming to New York to go and tour with him. And this was one week after I got fired from, from Charles Erlin. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about Ornette, except for reading about him in Downbeat Magazine. But I knew that he was playing some real interesting music, but I didn't really know what was going on. So anyway, I went to New York. He invited me to go to Europe with him for a week, and we wound up staying in Paris for like six months. <laughs> <laughs> I was 19 years old. It was crazy. Oh, uh, man. And so that was, so that's pretty much, and then, you know, I started making my own records, started producing, and, you know, so that's how that happened. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I've got some notes down here, and one of them is Ornette Coleman, Prime Time. Prime Time, and, yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, it, it was hard for me to kind of envision you know, or because Ornette was out there, man. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and you know what I know about what you have played, I, I right. could, it was hard for me to make that connection. connection yeah, but. Yeah. but that's interesting though, because, um, you know, yeah, I grew up listening to folk music. You know, like you know, mm -hmm. listening. So basically, we just integrated that that mindset into what he had, what he was doing, because mm -hmm. he was always um, he was always advanced in his approach to music. And so what we brought to that concept was um, an updated rhythmic concept, you might say, because the rhythm is always changing, you know, in music. The rhythm is always, I mean, the way that guys are playing drums now is different than the way they were playing drums in the 60s, as the, those guys were different than the way the guys were playing in the 30s, you know, so rhythm is, all, the music, the notes have always been the same, but the rhythm kind of was always the thing that sort of put it in perspective in terms of the masses or the way that people accepted it. Mm -hmm. But musically, Ornette always was it very advanced in his in his concept of the music, you know. Mm -hmm. But we put that kind of, you know, energy uh, that 80s, just like Miles did with like, with you know, like the electric band, the Miles electric band. Mm -hmm. Ornette did the same thing, you know. We were actually coming out of the disco era, you mm -hmm. know, some stuff, you know, some, some real funk stuff with him with Ornette, you know. Yeah. I I have an Ornette story though. Because or and I'm wondering whether you were with him then. Okay. Ornette appeared on uh Saturday Night Live. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> you were on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was one of the most amazing Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, I, I tell people <laughs> it started out and I had this look on my face like, what is that? <laughs> He's doing. You know, I right, can't right, do right. But three minutes later, I'm like, <laughs> he was just, it was just, yeah, 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 it was yeah. like everybody took off yeah, yeah, from yeah, the yeah. same place, but went in a different direction. Absolutely. absolutely. And they all kept going and all, and like about three minutes, four minutes oh, in, they no, started okay. coming together. And I mean, that was the, yeah, yeah. I had never heard anything like yeah, that. Yeah, And that's what, you know, I mean, that's how life is. You know, life is a, is a very improv improvisational thing that, you know, you never really do the same thing even if you're doing the same thing, it's never the same mm -hmm. each and every time. It's always changing. Mm -hmm. And musically, we thought that same way. Um, you know, there were certain elements that we did uh, that we created while we were improvising. And always the melody and the composition was the most important thing. We, you know, the, the melody, the notes of the melody was the most important thing. When we created from that, we always sort of went away from it, but always came back to it, you know, yeah. <laughs> but we always came back to it. So, you know, I mean, it was very interesting that, working with Ornette. That was the most lot. amazing thing yeah. I have ever heard in my life. You know, and you and know, I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> you know, I've been out there for a minute and I've never heard anything like that. My, and and Doug. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's refreshing, you know, it's yeah. refreshing. You know, um, Howard Shore, who was the music director for Saturday Night Live at the time, was a great fan of Ornette's. And actually, Howard went on to become the composer for, like, a lot of major films, like yeah, yeah. Lord of the Rings, you know, and a lot I've of stuff. I've heard that name, yeah. He's done some major stuff. But at that time, he was a music director for Saturday Night Live, and he loved Ornette, and that's how we got on. And Milton Berle hosted the show that night. So, who? Milton Berle, the oh. actor, comedian. <laughs> That is amazing, man. That's some great history. That was that was that was. Who else was in that band? Charles, er, uh, Charlie, um, Charles Ellaby, guitarist from Philadelphia. Uh, Charlie Ellaby, uh, Gennaro Coleman, Ornette's son on drums, mm -hmm. Ronald Shannon Jackson on drums, uh, Burn Nix on guitar, and um, myself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man. They poof, wore that out. Um, <laughs> What you've been doing lately, how would you describe it, you know, like the past decade or so? Can you 
if you had uh, to describe the music you've been doing. Yeah, you know, I was I started off at you know as a as a um, in my solo artist career. I started off with a label in New York called Grammar Vision Records, and Grammar Vision was a great re record label in that they allowed me to do basically whatever I wanted to do, and that was un that was unheard of for a label to let an artist do that. You know, at that particular time, um, you know, when you were making records back then, you was always like the A and R guy in the room you know, suggesting what you should do and, and you know, or the lawyer who put the deal together, he's in the room, you know, suggesting musically what's going on, get out of here. Anyway, so that, that's what happened more in the R&B world. In the jazz world, you kind of, in the more commercial way, you had that kind of thing. But the music that we were doing, more improv improvised music, uh, creative music, um, you know, the production was left up to us totally and uh, the creative aspect was left up to us totally. So, you know, for the, the beginning of my career being with Grammar Vision, it, it allowed me to really, really just stretch myself as a composer, also stretch myself as a, as a musician, as a bass guitarist, because at that time you had Stanley Clark, who was sort of leading the way uh, on the bass guitar, like the 70s. Mm -hmm. You had Alfonso Johnson, also from Philadelphia, was, you know, with Weather Report and, all hit and George Duke. Then you had Jaco Pastorius, who was with, with Weather Report, and they were all like sort of you know like leading the pack in terms of more progressive bass players. So I kind of like came after that, and you know, but I was still trying to hear the bass in a different way, and Ornette kind of allowed me to do that. So when I started making my own records, I just took that concept further. You know, I just took it further, and so I had a chance to to do my, like even my first album, Showstopper. Um, it was a, a piece on there called The Bird of Paradise, which, uh, which I recorded with a, uh, a classical opera singer named Wilhelmina Fernandez, who was a <laughs> movie diva. Yeah. So it was a string quartet piece. And, you know, so I was able to do things like that. And, you know, it just made it, just made it all worthwhile for me just to be creative like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I was producing records for labels here in Philly, like Philly World Records. They were located down uh, uh, down in South Philly, um, and so you know I had I was doing things like that as well at the same time. I always worked as a producer at the same time as a solo artist. You know, you know, I always enjoyed doing that. You know, mm -hmm. with other people. Who or what have you produced that I might be familiar? Um, let me see. Because uh, you've done work with Ursula. Uh, Ursula's done work with. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. You uh, done uh, any produced any of her stuff? Yeah, not her stuff as a solo artist, but I, stuff that she worked with me. Uh -huh. uh, actually, the first time that she went to Europe, I, I took her to Europe. Oh, okay. Um, as well as the Roots, the group, the Roots. They went. Uh, you know, I invited them to Europe to mm -hmm. Germany for this festival. Um, mm. I produced stuff with Grover Washington Jr. I produced stuff with the Roots actually on my albums. Um, you know, it's a, it's a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I got a wall full of stuff that I worked on. And, you know, it's like, I just look at that stuff, you know, all those CDs and records. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, <laughs> you mentioned that uh, as a kid, mm -hmm. you were singing. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever sung on any of your albums later on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the cosmetic album, you know, the album I have. Oh, man. There, there's a, there's a, the, this one band I had called Cosmetic uh, from Philadelphia. Um, uh, there, we put an album out, uh, and I put an album out, and the name of the album was called So Tranquilizing, and the title mm -hmm. track from the album, So Tranquilizing, there was a video that was done that was shown on v VH1, MTV, and you got to check that out. I'm singing in the whole bit, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I got to look that up. <laughs> yeah, I love singing. I can't sing, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta, I've got to check that out. I know singers, though. I know singers. I know singers. I know what to listen for in a singer, you know, mm -hmm. because being from being at the Uptown, everybody came there, you know, I mean, yeah, all, sure. I mean, before they were famous, they came there and they were awesome singers. They were awesome vocalists. Oh, incredible. All groups, you know. And uh, so many of them raised and nurtured here in Philly, too. Yeah, yeah. Some of the yeah. greatest. Um, yep, yeah. Have you ever uh, toyed or, or tinkered in the gospel area? No, no, well, no, no, I never did that. Uh -huh. uh, mainly right at, right now, maybe early on I would have, but right, I, you know, I converted to Islam, so. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 
you know, I, I know it quite well because mm -hmm. that, that time I used to go down south. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was major North Carolina. Look, you know, mm -hmm. we, we go to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, you know, I mean, like those, you know, those hymns and things that they would sing, you know, they, it would go right through you because mm -hmm. the sincerity in it, mm -hmm. the, and, and then they had, they, they were singing, singing folks too. I mean, they, you, oh, you, sure. And so many people came out of the church. Yeah, who uh, yeah. Were, were vocalists? And yeah. I just I wondered only because there's really some great stuff yeah. in that uh, 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 genre. And the guy, brother's name is escaping me, who I had on, who does a show Sunday morning on RTI. Oh yeah, I listen to the show sometimes. Yeah, he's also a, a vocalist. Okay. He may even play with the on keyboards too. But I know he. I saw him sing, um, and I've heard him in some of his. CDs and he's incredible and I can't think of yeah. his name to save my life right now. I've heard him. I don't know. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Sometimes I want everybody to drive in and I cut it on and and mm -hmm. he does not like straight gospel stuff. He'll do some right. stuff that's spiritually inclined, say like Donny Hathaway, mm -hmm. or Wonder, or you know, you know things like that. So he kind of mixes it up and that's yeah. Nice. He, but then he also might go back to some Dixie Hummingbirds, right, right, you know, stuff yeah. like that. You know, yeah. some yeah. Jackson, sure, you know, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, and oh man, I, it is. I wish I could think of his name right now, but he is. He is. He's an amazing vocalist, though. Mm. Um, did you? I saw on Facebook. You, did you get a recent award? Some kind of award? Recently? Yeah, there were. Yeah, there were several things that were happening. The Philadelphia, um, uh, the Philadelphia Award. I was given that by Mayor Kenny, uh, mm. uh, at City Hall. Uh, the Clef Club of Jazz Award. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Marcus Garvey Award that was given to me by James Spady when he was living. Um, yeah, there was this few things that was you know, given to me, and you know, I was really appreciative of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you most deserving, I'm sure. Um, I did want to ask you something that I've, I've really uh, asked a couple of artists that I've been mm -hmm. with, only because you know I, I've just been frustrated. Mm. Over the past couple of decades, myself following people like you, like Ursula, right, and uh, Wadud, and others who I just find absolutely amazing. And as somebody who came of age and you know was in college in the '70s, mm -hmm. and people like you and them would just have been embraced. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I knew knew of the last poets and. Gil oh, Scott and everybody. Hmm? Yeah, you asked me one thing. Yeah, you asked me um, was there any productions that I worked on recently? Yeah, one of them was the Last Poets. Oh, okay. I produced their last album. Yeah, I got to check that out too. Yeah, but uh, what I was going to say was like everybody knew them. Yeah, and uh, and like I said, you know, the past couple of decades, I'm like, you know, there's people doing some great stuff, and they can't get yeah. airtime. Yeah. It's, it's, it's business. It's, it's segueing into what you want to discuss. It's, it, it's, that's all about business. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the labels, um, you know, that's why I say when I was with Grammar Vision, they allowed me to do anything. Of course, they wanted to have a profit in what they were doing. They wanted to make money as what they were doing, but they also valued the art in what we were doing. So mm -hmm. uh, it made it easier for me to do what I wanted to do. Um, but you know, when it comes down to other situations, it, it comes down to money and it comes down to business. Mm -hmm. I mean, even myself, they didn't really know even where to place my records in the in the bins, you know, because the, the <laughs> music was so eclectic, and you know, the label let me do it, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you know, you know, it, it, it all boiled down to to business and and money. And so, when they find a product or they find somebody that you know doesn't have a problem with you know shaking their ass or you know, showing their body or cursing, you know, I mean, you know, like in extreme way, you know, the bitches and the whores and the, you know, this and all of that, you know, kind of thing. They embrace that, you know, but if somebody is talking about something that's positive, especially in the climate that we are in now, you know, they, they're not trying to hear that. And that's why it's important right now for all the artists who, who are thinking in a more of an independent way to continue to do their art because that's you know that's where it's at now and it's and it's and it's it's nicer now because you have the internet you have the social media situation where you can do your product and have it heard you know immediately 
not have to wait for a label to put it out. You can control your image. You can, you know, sort of uh, have it set up where, you know, you can be seen in the light that you want to be seen in, you know. So how are you, this is kind of related to that, but how, how are you received overseas? Oh, it's, and it, yeah, I know. It's, it's you know, it's always been more, you know, we, we as African Americans have always been received uh, uh, greater over in Europe and Asia more than we, we are at, a, at our home. Um, mm -hmm. When I started playing, you know, I mean, like right now is very interesting that I'm beginning to do more work here in America. But a lot of my work previously came from, uh, you know, came from, from Europe and Asia. Um, they just appreciate the music a little bit more. They understand. Where in Asia? Uh, Korea. I've been going to Korea for almost like 30 years now, mm -hmm. you know, playing with some master Korean musicians there that, you know, we sort of mix uh, creative, you know, music, so-called jazz with their traditional music. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've been doing that for 30 years with them. You know, um, I was just there maybe two years ago. And you know, this singer named Alma, Lady Alma? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I took her, I took her, I took her, to, I took her to, uh, to Korea a couple years ago. Man, she mm -hmm. tore that place up. Mm -hmm. nah, she is anyway, right? Yeah, right, right. But, man, right. She had those Korean folks going crazy. Yeah. You know? So they, you know, so they like what we do over there. Um, of course, all throughout Europe. Um, been going to Europe, man, since, you know, well, since 19, I'm 64 now. I've been going to Europe since I was 19. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, you know, I mean, I think right now people are beginning to appreciate you know, music here more in America because they have to, you know, they have to. I mean, the music is being put in front of their face; they can't deny it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, what do you think needs to happen in terms of the industry? In you know, I often guys our age, my age, you know, I'm constantly preaching to them, like, you know, mainstream, <laughs> mainstream <laughs> radio is not where it is, man. You know, you right. got to dig just a little bit, but there's all kinds, right. all kinds of talent, you know, all kinds of music yeah. is just out of this world. You just have to look for it a little more than you used to, you know? Right. Right. Well, what do you think the industry, um, the, you know, the r radio, what, what needs to happen? Well, the, in the, the industry, I mean, there's no, the industry has changed to the point where in terms of the labels, there's no, there's no labels that's giving any record deals out anymore. Mm. So the, the younger, you know, the, like myself, early being with Grammar Vision early on, there was in place a, a promotional uh, unit that uh, made sure that I got the promotion that I, I needed to be able to do what I needed to do. Um, whereas now the younger folks, they don't have labels and they don't have any kind of promotional team. You do, like I said, you do have what you, you do have your situation where you can do your, um, your promotion yourself, but you know, that could be very limited. You know, when you got a machine that's behind you, that's pushing you, um, it's, 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 it's endless as to what can happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of the artists were more successful than, as they, than now. You might have a few that's successful now, and that's because somebody is, you know, they have some kind of backing, some kind of sponsorship. Mm -hmm. um, but what has to happen now, the education has to happen with the younger folks, knowing that in this particular climate, that they have to be independent. They have to be independent. They have to find a way to 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 do something for themselves and not wait on mm -hmm. a, label, a label which is there's no labels now that's doing that for them anymore and they have to find ways of doing some things for themselves and i always i always tell them that a lot of times i'm doing master classes and i have this one uh class called music in the human experience and i deal with um music but i also deal with uh, what they're going to be facing on a business level and what they're going to be facing on a human level because uh, the whole idea of them just putting all of their effort and all their time into the music and they themselves are not spiritually inclined. They themselves are not uh, set up where they can deal with all the stuff that's out there in the world uh, because in their mind, they're just thinking about being a star and, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more to it than that, you know. Mm -hmm. it, um, 
you know, you know, when you're traveling, you got to make sure that everything is straight with your travel. You got to be, you know, there's a lot of things that goes goes on that has nothing to really to do with the music on stage, mm -hmm. you know. And so there's a whole gamut of things that uh, the, the the youth they have to be able to understand how to maneuver through it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think once they be able to get a handle on that, you know, they'll be okay because, like I said, there's no labels that's offering them anything. There's no, you know. I mean, you got a guy that's in his room, his bedroom, making music, and you know, he's not really having to wait for a label to come by and say, "Well, we, we're going to do this for you, or we're not going to do this for you," or or that particular artist that has ha that has had a record deal, they feel so pressured because, you know, maybe that first record was a success, so the label is waiting for them to do that again, and that might not happen again. You know, they're not free. They they already already they are sort of you know um depressed about trying to give that label another record you know at the same level that the the first ones were so mm. i feel you um so you have anything what what should we be looking out for from you uh in the immediate <laughs> short term yeah, you know it's funny it's funny there's so many things and you know when i'm doing these interviews i could never think about them my manager would say well why can you even say that why can you even say that? <laughs> but you know right now um i'm just laying low you know like i said you know uh basically um you know being on the road for so long mm -hmm. um and now you know unfortunately with the situation with covid uh that is one thing, but there's some things that have come out of it. The first thing is this, we all have to try to be as safe as we possibly can. You know, we should always, I mean, I just found out today that a friend of mine had COVID, he just got, he had COVID. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a real thing. And, and, and I don't understand how folks can think that it's not. And, you know, and so, you know, doing, use, utilizing all the precautions that one could to be able to, to combat it, this is, it's not a, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So, um, I'm just basically laying low, um, but I've been doing these virtual productions, um, reaching out to, because like the, the the Outsiders Festival, which we were on our sixth year mm -hmm. um, um, uh, celebration about you know having that festival go for five years and going into the sixth year, that was it was a beautiful thing. But because of COVID, you know, I had to rethink how I was going to do everything. So from the the red carpet room, which is a, a space that I have, because I, I work also as a stylist, because mm -hmm. I, I like fashion a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and also I've been able to concentrate on that as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I always did both things all at the same time, because, you know, again, remember, you know, being at the Uptown or at the <laughs> Apollo, you know, all those guys were sharp. So, and then being around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. all those guys were sharp. So that's what I saw. And that always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, always, had a situation and a, and a passion to help my fellow brother or sister mm. in looking absolutely the best that they can, you know. Mm -hmm. So the red carpet room is a, is a place, is a is actual room where um, folks come and they see things and they purchase things and or they, you know, or whatever. Is that in here? Is that here? That's here no? in Philadelphia. That, yeah. I'm, here, I'm here right now, actually. <laughs> and it's, it's a, it, you know, because I started off, um, as a stylist, you know, this guy might say, well, Jamal, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, something. Uh, I will say, okay, well, I would go out and find it mm -hmm. and I would put it, put it all together for them. And they would go like, wow, that looks great. And they, mm -hmm. you know, they wear it to wherever they were going and, you know, got, got their compliments and they would say, well, Jamal, can you do this for me again? You know, like, you know, a lot of times guys don't have the time to go out like I do. I'm, I'm hitting everywhere looking for stuff, you know, mm -hmm. uh, vintage pieces, um, estate sales, you know, um, any anything that has any kind of uh, a vibration of, of of style or of fashion, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm into it. So, you know, I've been concentrating on that a lot. Um, but the uh, the virtual uh, performances, uh, what I did was I found this application that allows me, unlike Zoom, um, where I could I could uh, do my part and I could send it to somebody else. They can do their part. He can send it on. And what you do is you at the end of it all, you have up to nine windows of musicians doing what they do, playing with each other. 
and it all being synced up. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, I have the mul- I have the tracks, the multi tracks, which I can enhance the sound as well. And so um, I've been doing that recently. And uh, you know, it's it's you know, the, it's outside this festival from the red carpet room, I call it the clean sweep sessions. And it's been really nice. I mean, I've had a lot of people, and, and it's interesting because I've been able to connect with people all around the world that I, I wouldn't able to been able to connect with anyway because you know of the flights being very expensive sure. so you know so it's like you know if i were to connect with this guitar player from sweden you know i contact him i do my thing i send it to him he does his thing send it back to me i send it you know so we all together from different parts of the world and it's a it's a beautiful thing one thing that i did i'm not sure if you're familiar with uh this drummer named bernard purdy sure. bernard yeah bernard purdy mm-hmm. he's like he's like you know logged in on 4,000 albums, you know, playing, you know. <laughs> right. So I had him do his drum part first. He sent it to me. I did my bass part on that. I sent it to Ray Parker Jr., the guitar player and producer. Mm, sure. he, he sent it to Robert, uh, uh, Rado Bell from Cool and the Gang, who, re, who mm. recently passed away. Right. Uh-huh. You know, Carlos Bell. And so you can see that on episode two, I think, episode two. Now, is this on your website uh, Website or something? Yeah, the website has the links as well. Yeah, okay. So, so I finished all three episodes, you know, from the outside of fest- virtual festival. And, oh, man, it's just a beautiful, you know, I mean, I do, I do a, a, a segment on fashion. You know, mm-hmm. the, first, the first episode I dealt with fashion from the 30s, 40s, and the 50s. And I talked about how music influenced fashion. And mm-hmm. I talked about how, you know, cats like Miles and Diz and, you know, the whole bebop era, how they looked when they were doing their thing, Duke and, and Cab Calloway and that whole, you know, Louis Armstrong from the 20s, you know, that mm-hmm. whole book. In the second episode, I dealt with music from the 60s and the 70s, and I dealt with the fashion from there as well. And that's when I had Ronald Bell and, you know, with, and, you know, you know Cool in the Gang, because they were part of that era. You know, and then I dealt with the whole fashion scene from the 60s and 70s. So the last episode, I dealt with um, the concept of the 80s and the 90s. And, you know, I had a whole segment of fashion and style from the 80s and the 90s. So that's pretty interesting to look at as well. So mm-hmm. that's that's the kind of things I've been doing lately. And it's been really rewarding. And people seem to enjoy it, you know, and it gives them something to do. Everybody's at home, you know, and um mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cool. Well, I'm going to definitely check it out. But, uh, yeah. look, I really want to thank you for, you know, sitting down with me, man. Oh, and like I said, I got to apologize again because I know All I've right. been in pain. But uh, look, 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 brother, it's been worth just, it. You, listen, brother, you do what you do, and <laughs> I appreciate you. And I'm, I am I just apologize, you know, wasn't able to, to get it done quicker. You know, but I, we're here now, and it's a blessing. Yeah. You know, the water busted, you know, uh-huh. in my basement, but I, I'm here. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, let's let's stay in touch, man, because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, things we can share. Um, just yeah. you know, you just make uh, giving me some ideas. So okay, uh, let's stay in touch. And thanks so much for you know this time. I'm going to so make fun. sure this gets out so people, if they don't yeah. know, they will know. And um, great, great, you know, great. We'll be checking you out, brother. Thank you so very much. And you can you continue to do what you're doing. All right, now. All I right. Will certainly do that. All right. Okay. Peace.